I wasn't expecting this event to be quite so formal. So, <laughs> this, so I haven't really made a presentation. This is really more of a brain dump of things. I didn't really have a title up until about two minutes ago. <laughs> so I thought, surely yeah, the best title for a, a talk in Agile Conference is the insert title here, and we'll figure out what the title should be later. Yeah. Uh, so if you like, instead, you will call it Continuous Documentation. I don't know. Um, and I'm going to kind of be flipping back and forth between live examples and my notes. So I first put a disclaimer for any bad writing in my notes. <laughs> so usually what I do, and most of these are going to be kind of, I come from more open source, free, as in beer and free, as in freedom software world, so I don't know much about data and these sorts of more enterprise level things, they're usually much more kind of smaller little projects, but still the same principle should apply, I guess, is the, is the point. What I show you as I, their ideas to try and model <laughs> that to you. Anyway, enough presentation. So, yeah, the first thing I'll say is so continuous integration, continuous documentation, continuous deployment, whatever we want to call it, and why do it? Um, firstly, is so you don't miss things. Um, Often as well, we've all talked about having documentation from different sources and you want it to become a certain standard. And so we're humans, we're not machines. Humans are not very good at repetitive tasks, computers are. So let's make them help us make some of these standardizations and boring tasks that actually you'd rather not do anyway. Um, and there's a, just a few ideas that I've jumped, jumped together. So there's already a typo there. I haven't got this through yet. So I haven't <laughs> So, um, let's start with spelling. So, I'm going to stick to one particular example because it's um, something I've used at the moment, we use at the moment, which is this tool for Markdown, Markdown spell check. <coughs> um, it's an NPM module, so it's JavaScript, um, but a lot of these tools all work very well with any kind of continuous integration tool you might like to use, or even if you just want to run it locally before you do something else with your documentation. There are some alternatives for um, other markup languages. Uh, I personally, my next step that I want to take with this is uh, there's a, an open source dictionary um, standard, it's kind of unspell, a spell, uh, which not only can you use in continuous integration, but you can also um, plug into things like OpenOffice or other desktop uh, tools. So you can actually share a dictionary amongst workmates and the continuous integration. So that's kind of a, a the next step for me. So I wrote a blog post for this company, CodeShip, who are a continuous integration um, provider. But at work, we have it uh, on Travis, which is another one. The principles are kind of the same. So in this case, basically, whenever you run a continuous integration um, service, it's a new, figure there's a new machine every time, so you kind of have to set it up with what you want. So this is just installing it. But the kind of important thing is when we actually start testing it. So in this particular example, we um, decide to spell check our markdown file. And I'll just jump back into my notes to remind me what those things mean. Because, yeah. So these various flags mean it runs the spell check on markdown files. This is just a spell check. I tried running it on some of things and it didn't really work. It runs it in report mode, so it gives you, an idea, it gives you a summary of the problems. It ignores numbers, which may or not, and an acronym, which you may or not want. And in this case, with a US English dictionary, uh, I have a <coughs> poor fortune with what it's actually like in US English, but I'm amongst friends here, I think, in that case, so it's <laughs> for once. Um, so, <coughs> I'll come back to what this uh, this here means in a second. So I'll show you an example here. This is in the code example. It does a bunch of things. Clones the repository of the um, documents I'm testing. You can see here it installs. Um, I don't know if 
from up there, it works, you know that. And then down here is kind of where you get to the injection point. So this is highlighting, this was some uh, documentation I wrote um, for CodeChip actually on some Docker related, so technology um, that we saw a snippet of in the presentation. There's lots of uh, custom language. There's lots of language here that is not, it's not the real word, but it's not the wrong word. So, you know, you need to customize these things to um, make these not recognize these errors. And the interesting thing we did here was we actually created a separate repository for the dictionary with the words that in our company's case we consider to be legitimate words that may not be considered real words, so they won't get flagged by the spell check. And then this gets pulled in every time the check happens. Um, and as I say, my next step would be to have this so it also applies to desktop users <laughs> writing in the day job. So the, the thing here, as you saw, this is very noisy. The, the problem with a lot of these um, tools is they can be quite noisy. Um, often when we want to, this is actually starting to get into the territory of something called minting in coding parlance, but we can use it in documentation parlance as well, to recommend um, re recommendations, basically. Um, and they can be quite noisy, they're usually guidelines, not necessarily wrong. These are things you might want to look at, which often means that they can be very noisy and you want to make that decision about uh, should errors here make the software build break or not? Should it still be deployed live or for testing or whatever because of a spelling error? That is up to, to you. Um, so what that true does in Project's case, and with Travis it's a slightly similar uh, flag but a different format, is say, whatever happens, just let it through. This is kind of for guidance only and whatever you get out, then um, still continue but someone will get a copy of this to then go through the review. And that's kind of up to you whether you want to do that or not. Um, and obviously once you sort of tweak this a bit, you might be able to then start saying, okay, spelling errors from now on and on. So, that's spelling. <laughs> so, the next one is kind of grammar writing better. This is a little bit like Grammarly, and you can actually see I've got um, the advantage of some of these tools, of course, use sort of more open text editors, and this is Atom, which has been mentioned a couple of times, from GitHub. Um, the tool I'm about to show you, which is quite good, which is reasonably popular, is also available in the editor, so they actually have a consistent kind of experience from my side, but of course I still can never rely on who else might have written it or where the contribution might come from. <laughs> Um, but what we're going to do here is, instead of either seeing these things, we'll again, we'll hook it up to infinity loop. And you probably already saw it here, it's a fairly similar kind of um, configuration. We install it, we run it, and likewise again, we get an output down here, which is pretty much the same as um, what we saw in the editor, but more of a report. And this tool especially, right with especially, <coughs> is uh, a, little, a little trickier to get into uh, continuous integration. It seems to, so without getting too into detail, what I discovered was the spell checker, it will just say zero or one, if there were problems or not. But this, uh, right for some reason, will output the number of problems it finds, which is weird to cope with in a kind of continuous integration <coughs> system. So you kind of have to just say, ignore it, just keep it as a report maybe. Especially with this sort of thing because it's more guide, it's very much more guidance. But it's a good way of just being able to see from other people's contributions or your own contributions, are there some things that got missed um, and get some standards. So, and some of the other options you can add here, it has a variety of different tests, um, a variety of different, <laughs> has a variety of different tests, uh, weasel words, um, which uh, 
it's a strange choice of the phrasing, the Lisa words, uh, not having too many so's, things like that, and you can include them or exclude them by, by default everything is enabled, and you can just enable particular tests or just disable particular tests. Um, and that's a way of configuring it, but generally, generally by and as I say, bear in mind, whenever you see these sorts of commands, you could run these on a local computer, you could run them on a configuration computer, and you get the same effect. Okay, testing code. So, um, one of the worst things I've always found, especially I actually come more from a background of writing in the past uh, tutorials for developer blogs, and because a blog is usually written and then kind of forgotten about, but they can still <coughs> um, come up quite regularly in search results. The worst thing is when you come across an example, you think, great, follow it, follow it, it doesn't work. That's it. Person's got bored of it. So having examples that don't work is incredibly <laughs> frustrating and will put people off. Um, so testing examples in code is a little bit more challenging actually, but I actually consider it possibly one of the more important things to try to get working. And it can depend slightly whether you're testing an API or an inline example. So for, for our APIs of the company I work at, we're currently using um, Dread, which is uh, designed for testing APIs. So it will actually look at the potential URLs and endpoints for, a, uh, uh, for um, an API and you say, here's what we, here's what usually gets sent, here's what we expect back, does that happen? And to show you a quick example, so for example here, this is setting up a particular endpoint with a variable, the parameters that get sent to it. Uh, you can even set things like the model of data that should be sent to it. And somewhere in here will be expected response to it, which is okay, basically. And then by running those, This time we don't have a tablet example. You will see. I've lost my the one I wanted to see. You will see. You can see some of my other tests that you looked at there. But further down here, you see these things. What was tested, how long did it take, which is also potentially useful, did it pass or not? I think most of our pass. I think I have one page <coughs> somewhere in there, but most of them pass. There's quite a lot of endpoints there, but it tests them all. And in this case, because the API is very important, actually work for an API company, if the API examples are not working, then that's a big problem. This is a weird one, this comes up all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and in our case, we're using API Blueprint, but we also work with um, Swagger and other things like that. Um, the testing in line code is a little harder, actually. It's something I'm still looking into. With uh, Python, if you're using Svint, which is quite common, with Read the Dot, sort of partner project write the dots, then it does do it. For other languages, I'm not so sure right now. I'm still looking into some options. More. So, get back to that. Images, screenshots. We talked about the pain of updating a small logo in a screenshot. Why not automate it? Great. This, um, I will jump straight to thanking um, the phone guys. <laughs> Um, for this, they have a whole bunch of tooling around what they do with a guide here that kind of explains how it all fits together. And 
very cool that you can jump into their documentation repository. Run this command using PhantomJS as kind of a hidden behind the scenes browser to start making swimming tests. It is super cool. Okay. And these screenshots have all been generated with awesome. <coughs> so you don't have to worry about updating the logo a thousand times because get a computer to do it for you instead. <laughs> so, um, this is a little bit more complicated to set up, but if you look at the Plum Project documents, they've done a lot of stuff on this and they've got it working quite well. So that's a source of inspiration for looking into it. Now, um, there's also more commercial tools uh, like Fastlane, which is mainly aimed at uh, iOS developers. And also, if you're doing Mac type software, don't forget Apple Script. Apple Script is actually very powerful. Uh, for example, when I was doing some video work briefly with uh, JetBrains, who make IDEs, they actually have some really cool Apple scripts that resize windows and things. So when you make videos and screenshots, everything's like perfect size for um, to be viewed in line on web pages and things like that. So if you're a Mac, you don't need Apple script. It might be dying soon, but use it once it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, videos, and this is a more interesting one. This is a this is getting into my more theoretical terms. I haven't really tested this. This is more of a maybe. And if someone wants to experiment with it, give it a go. There's this quite interesting service called Askinema, or Askinema, or however you want to pronounce it, um, which has a video for terminals. So, this is actually my terminal that I recorded at some point, and I typed some commands, and it <coughs> made a video. But it's not actually a video. This is the cool thing. It's actually a bunch of JSON data. So this got me thinking. In theory, from your examples, you could generate the JSON and then make videos out of continuous integration. <coughs> and this is a this is one principle. I've tested this here. This is an idea. Because it actually is just code. So you can generate videos automatically as well. Obviously, only in kind of terminal examples, but that's quite a lot of examples, in, especially in the software um, space. So and here's what the JSON file looks like. So this is that video we just saw. Not terribly readable. <laughs> but once you, actually, if you read their documentation, it makes a lot more sense. And this isn't helped by the fact that I have that. <coughs> Terminal with a koala and things like that. It doesn't help. <laughs> so if the, the terminal was a lot simpler, this would be simpler to understand. But it is basically the JSON. And this is the time weighted and things like that. So it actually is, um, is a sort. And you can see here, you can obviously just embed it in, um, embed it in HTML again. No video player in here. Yeah. What about hosting the video? Okay. So, code examples. Um, kind of already talked about the examples, but interactivity has also been um, something that I've found, especially with languages that let you play around in the browser, like JavaScript, for example, or um, Ruby, or languages that can run better in a browser you can actually start to have a lot of interactivity in your documentation, as Ben alluded to, but also you get a lot more interactivity with your documentation. Found that it worked very, very well, especially with something like JS Fiddle, which is a service anyone can kind of just put some JavaScript in, embed it, and people can play around with it, and then they read something and they can experiment with the outcome. So one of my other kind of high end sky ideas that we think about is also generating that. So in the same way that we take the code examples, test them, make a video out of them, we can also feed them out to um, one of these services that has an API um, and generate the uh, playgrounds, shall we call them, dynamically as well. So this is all saying every time you make a small change, you don't have to think about update languages, update my videos, <coughs> update my examples, update the playgrounds. It all actually just updates depending on what um, and I want to have a chat with Ben to see how possible it is to, to capture those. I added that to the list five minutes ago. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 
There's some other cases as well that are sort of, sort of maybe to do with Jupiter, which is like a more of a notebook, but you could link out to it. Run, kit, and bear, bear still, maybe on a more local one as well. So that's my wrap up. Setting all this up takes some time, but um, I think it pays off in the end um, because you have less inaccuracies, uh, more hopefully positive experiences from people. And um, yeah, computers are far better than we. That's me. I am a technical writer for a company in Berlin called Contentful, which is a, an API based content management system and blog a lot for various people at this website too. But I actually ran out of stickers, so I should take them. <laughs> but um, thanks very much. And I think this is anyone who's interested in this kind of stuff, I think maybe we'll bring our laptop to the pub. <laughs> 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 but if you've got any questions, <laughs> 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 <laughs>